Thanks. Okay, for those who will be watching this or listening to this, my name is Bernard Sweeney. I'm an Irish traveller and I'm based here in Sligo. I'm co-hosting with my friend Dylan uh, Foley. Right. So now I'm going to give you a introduction of our guests and then we'll open it up and we'll take it into a conversation mode. I'll start with Grafton Puxton. He's a eyewitness, actually. One of the first people to uh, start examining the yellow document of 1963. He was a young man who left England who did not want to uh, engage with war or violence, if that's my basic understanding. He arrived in Dublin, but he had an advantage because he had also Irish ancestry. So he wasn't a complete stranger. He took up the role as a young journalist. Uh, before he knew it, he had walked himself into one of the longest historical battles on earth between battle of the mentalities he ended up living, not standing with, not just supporting, but living with the people who were labelled itinerants at the time with his own wagon. And as I mentioned, one of the first people to actually start examining the 1963 uh, report. Now, that's Grafton, and we're going to talk with Grafton in a moment. And then we got Brian Harvey. And Brian Harvey is one of those incredible um, CVs. As my friend said to me earlier, he's either a genius or he's, he's stone mad. Uh, it's going to be one yeah. or the other. <laughs> but Brian Harvey is an independent social researcher working in both uh, parts of Ireland, Britain and continental Europe in social policy, analysis, research, evaluation and strategic planning. His main fields of work are poverty, social inclusion, community development, equality, human rights, European integration, and the world non-government organization examples. And it goes on and on and on. He has several books, um, papers, and he's also very much on a sideline. He writes uh, quite a bit on uh, space flight, um, the Soviet Union, uh, India. Uh, I think there's some Japanese in there. But uh, yeah, and and I when I was looking at that, I was thinking, my God, I'm going to have a podcast alone on that kind of stuff. So now I'm going to open it up, but I'm going to start off with it. I suppose starting with Grafton. One of the frightening things for me when I was reading that was, if the people never knew what was going on at state level, they never informed, never told. These people were going on about their businesses into little villages, into little towns, into wherever they were going, doing their thing. And all of a sudden, the terms and references was read out on two occasions at a national level, both on the radio and the papers. So travellers were absolutely caught off guard because now these villagers were looking at them in a different kind of light because they were told to go out and spy on people who they thought were tinkers and itinerants and get their names, get their locations, get their habits and that kind of created a weird, strange environment there. Is the one thing that uh, I talked to Grafton last time about was when he was in Dublin. Uh, he had mentioned that travellers were on Cronwell's cabbage patch. And I just thought that was actually quite strange and wonderful at the same time. Mm. That there was a group of itinerants being chased all over Dublin by the corporations and big bad old Reynolds. Um, that they found this patch in Dublin called Cronwell's Cabbage Patch. Can you briefly tell me about that and maybe Din Grafton about how you came involved with all of this? Yeah, well, OK, let's start with Cronwell's Cabbage Patch. That's down at Bow Lane. I don't know whether it's still got the same name. I know they've built a whole lot of flats down there now. But at that time, I had a strange piece of land that was under the walls of Kilmainham Hospital up there, if you can imagine, if you know Dublin, and below was um, Irwin Street, and then it went along the Camac River, that little cabbage patch area. I, I, I don't know if it's got any kind of border, but it's just a kind of general name. Now, my wagon that I put up there on, on the land above was spotted by Bill Reynolds, and the next thing I knew, get off here you know you've got no right on here and i said well i i, I said i just bought this piece of land uh you know and i'm i'm, I'm in the wagon while i repair the house to, because it was in a complete derelict state but he said okay if you're not out here you know we're going to get you off so 
on the land itself was John Keenan and his family. They just had a tent there, a big, a big tent. And he was collecting bottles and stuff for, for a few pence to, to make a living on. So he said, look, if you've got a shift, let's go together. And we went up together to this place called the Ring Road. Now, the Ring Road must still be there. And it was just a piece of factory land that we pulled onto on there alongside the Grand Canal. But I was in Dublin because I'd got my papers call up from the British Army and I wasn't going to serve. Uh, I was doing an apprenticeship as a reporter journalist on a provincial paper in England. So all these things kind of combined because in a way it was a kind of a story. But of course, I immediately stepped over the line and was on the other side of the barricade, as it were. And I was, of course, all for, all for the barricades. And you can see right behind me the school that we had at um, Cherry Orchard. That was the second school. The first school was built, built was burnt down by, by Dublin Corporation, a big eviction operation uh, very early on in 1963, still, still January 1963. And that kind of set the whole thing going. We were evicted about 10 times. And then we were on the back lane near Palmerston, between Valley Firm and Palmerston. And that was kind of a traditional place to pull in, although it was a very narrow lane. And the guards came along and started measuring up and said, you're, you know, you're uh, obstructing the highway. So when they'd gone away, it was a big... Um, by bar gate. Let's go in there. We pushed open the gate. My wagon was the first in there. And very quickly, a lot of travelers came together at, at that piece of land, Cherry Orchard. Um, and it's just going to be 60 years ago next year that we all pulled in there and got something started. So yeah, you, you kind of described me as one thing, but I, I, I just kind of fell into the whole situation. You know, I didn't plan to be the you know, advocate for itinerance, but I was with the travelers when we moved into Cherry Orchard and oh, everything tumbled in on top of me after that. Although, you know, the idea of having a school cause was kind of my idea and it added to the dimension. We thought that, you know, a school, hey, people are going to say, yeah, that's great, you know. Don't touch the traveler's school. But when we went from the Ring Road down to City Hall just to ask for a standpipe, we got down to the manager and he said, fuck off, you know, you've no right on that land. You're not going to get a standpipe or anything else. And, you know, we, within a week or 10 days, they were evicting us from there. Wow. So that's the whole how the whole thing took off. Yeah, there's um, I remember uh, that that sticking out as in terms. There seemed to be a, some sense of history or connection with history, uh, with travellers even in the sixties. If to was it the travellers that called it uh, Cromwell's Cabbage Patch or was that no, the... no, 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 no. I think it's some old historical. It was just a neighbours called it that. I picked up that name. I never saw it written down, but uh, that was the name that neighbours had around. Uh, Old Kilmainham Road, then Irwin Street, and then it goes down to the river, to the Liffey, if you follow that, that way down. Yeah, it was, it was... But the significance of Cherry Orchard, if I might say this, a lot um, a lot should be credited to the travellers. Let me say this, because you touched on the commission, of course. But I didn't know much about the commission. I did, I did see a copy of it. Um because Joe Donahue had a copy in his wagon. And Joe Donahue was, as far as I know, the only traveler that the commission talked to, because there had been a meeting held, I wasn't there, at um, the social center in Ballyfermot. And travelers were invited to come along and talk, you know, give their, give their side the stories as well. I don't think that the commission um, was ever going to carry out what they recommended to carry out. And that is the great threat of ending the traveling way of life. I mean, that, that, that that's 
not in the sense that they were going to resettle people. It was only in the sense they wanted to drive us out of the city. And they weren't too happy when we showed up in, in the county Dublin. Because oh, eventually we were driven just to the very edge of the of Dublin city, which which is that road, the back road, which is the dividing line, I think, between the county and the, and the city. But what, what I want to say is that Cherry Orchard, because it drew publicity and so on, it even got on television in France, and that made a link with the whole bigger Romany movement because two people came over from France, Vida Voivod, who was the person who started the movement in Paris. He'd escaped from Moldova just at the end of the war, lost, lost a lot of family in, in the Holocaust and uh, started the Community Mondial Gitan on pieces of land around the Bidonvilles in Paris. So that made a link. Bankaruda followed him. Bankaruda, myself and others, travelers from Cherry Orchard, we went down to Balna Slow and, and, and hired the town hall for the first travelers convention. So that all these things kind of linked up and became part of a you know much bigger movement because it's, it's growing today. Because only four years after that, the Hanrans, myself, Tommy Doherty, we were the very first people in 1968 to make a delegation to the Council of Europe and all that's followed through the EU and all the programs for Romerol had to follow from that, from the Social Commission. So in a way, a lot of things started from, from the travelers stand at Cherry Orchard. So if there's a celebration of it next year, it could be something, it could be you know, worth talking about and Absolutely. seeing it started. There was a... Um... I, I, I put this over to Brian as a researcher over the years. I doubt you've ever seen a document that has ever said the final solution. There can be no final solution until these people are absorbed. I'm pretty certain yeah. you've never seen anything since that from 1963. But even to grasp that, that could only have a profound negative effect when the state and the government says this is a done deal. This may look like nice text. And it may look like we're going to help them. It's going to hurt us more. That's going to hurt them kind of attitude. But nevertheless, it laid, it paved the way for, for almost, some people use the word genocidal. Uh, we know a couple of researchers have used it. And I'm an inclined yeah. to go that direction with it because although yeah. there are similarities in the language, I don't think that the same mentality is at play. I think the one in Ireland has its own direct line going back into colonization where the one in Germany had one gone into a sanity, I guess. But nevertheless, there was similarities. Uh, othering people, there was conversations about how they might uh, label the itinerants so the state can identify them. They would wear a badge. There was talking about taking their children from them. Really? The, the ones on the road, yeah. This popped up in, um, in the review of the Travelling Body in 1983, where they talked about the discussions that went on in 1963 report. Mm -hmm. The part about the, the wearing the labels didn't go into the 63 report, but it went into the 83 report, making reference that they came from the 63 discussions. Mm -hmm. Now, it was uh, it was the, what would you call it, declined. It, it never went through. And, and this came up recently, and the politicians were saying, yeah, yeah that, that came up, but at least they, they squashed it. It never happened. But decided the reason why it didn't yeah. happen. And the yeah. reason it didn't happen was because one of the main reasons was it would be it would cost too much for administration. That was the the root cause why it didn't go ahead. But yeah. even the threat um, of taking children um, institutionalized them. And we know also within them spaces through the years and the decades came at least four or five segregated care state institutions that housed itinerants only. Uh, we knew there was a lot yeah. of segregation and signing and other social services. I suppose mm -hmm. where I'm going, Brian, is in your research life, um, mixing with travelers, NGOs, state agencies, politicians, could you kind of give us your description or feelings on the 63 report leading up to the present day, maybe? Does that, was that to me? No, it's to you. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll listen I'll to you. I'll come straight back to you again, my friend. Okay. Um, 
I, I unfortunately I was too young to remember the 1963 report. I think I was starting school at the time. I'm giving away my age now, um, so I've I've no recollection of it. But I did I did look back at it uh, the other day, and the the two things that hit me out front were this commission is here to deal with the problem of itinerance. Uh, leaving aside the issue of the use of the language itinerants, but they were defined, I think, in the, the opening paragraph as a problem to everyone else. That was the first thing. And then once you got on to page two, you quickly found the solution, which was, as you yourself pointed out earlier, the A word absorption. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the way this thing started. But I think one of one of the key aspects of the 1963 report was i think it to use a phrase borrowed from my colleague mary murphy in nui maynooth it drove the discourse the way in which the issue of travelers were perceived in the rest of the community uh, the fact that they were a problem the fact that they needed absorption that was that was the that was the facts as determined yeah. by the Irish state, and I think there are a couple of reasons. I think we do have to ask ourselves the question: the 1963 Commission, why then? Why now? Why why did it happen then? And I think there were a number of factors work which I I think have already been touched on that relationships, particularly in rural communities between travellers and settled people, and I've heard this too, were not that bad, but what happened in the early 1960s. Ireland became an expanding country. The population was not leaving in the vast numbers that used to be the case. There was two things, a lot of fresh pressure on land. And we've been, Grattan has been talking about land uh, and the importance of land in this. There was much more pressure on land and to develop that land. And second, and my informant on this is a report written on the traveller economy in the 1980s, I, I think, um, by Neil Crowley. And the economy of the traveller community, which has been so so much neglected, in my view, um, and e e economics often does come to the heart of this, was changing quite a bit from the old and the word tinkers came from tin work, as I understand it, and you were a society beginning to undergo rapid industrial change. And that's how the itinerants, as the government saw them, became evident as a problem to society. Uh, my memory of uh, what happened, and this was driven by the discourse, if I come back to the phrase, was of the establishment in the 60s and 70s on what were called itinerant settlement committees. Um, and these were often initiated by well-meaning uh, philanthropic people, often in the in the Quaker community and so on. They were well intended, but it was still a discourse that saw travellers as very weak, very helpless, certainly not capable of self-organisation, uh, who needed to be helped into standard society and its great benefits by settled people. And some of this work was certainly intended to be benign, but it was informed by a discourse that was fundamentally colonistic, as you yourself, I think, well put it. I think if I could move forward a little bit, I think the discourse did begin to change. The, the next landmark was, as you know, 20 years later, the traveller, uh, travelling people review body, at least the language had changed by then. Um, it recommended a national body for traveller welfare, but was still very much in welfare mode. We're not yet talking about housing. We're not yet talking about rights. We're not yet talking very much about services and education or the traveller economy, those things that matter. 2012, I'm doing what's called in, in the language that we use a lot now, periodization. It's an awkward word, but it is how do you look at the evolution of an issue over time, of a discourse over time. The um, National uh, Traveller and Roma Integration Strategy in 2012, and finally the recognition of um, the traveller community as a distinct uh, uh, ethnic minority within Ireland. So logically, if you take the path from 1963 to 2017 as a stop point, uh, where you did finally get that recognition in terms that travellers themselves actually wanted for the first time, that should be the end of the story then, shouldn't it? But it's not. Uh, we can. Uh, you probably want to come back onto that in a moment later. But that is my periodization. 
the way in which I would emphasize the way in which the discourse is portrayed by government and by the appointees of government. There are no travelers on the Commission of Itinerancy. There were plenty mm. of learned judges, doctors of divinity even. They were considered to be able to shed more light on the issue than an actual real traveler themselves. Um, so, but that is my view on how that played out over the years. And then maybe we can move on to the present tense later on. Can I go back to 1963 a little bit? By using the word itinerant, that was, of course, a bit of cultural robbery, because even today, we're not quite sure what travellers are going to call themselves, as like travellers, which is fine. Parvi, Minke, I don't know, which, you know, that, that's for them to decide. But the, the introduction of the word itinerant was a robbery in itself, of course, and and, and was a big step towards saying, you know, travellers are just a bunch of people who, who maybe took to the road during the famine. That kind, that kind of uh, line, line na narrative that was introduced then. Now, the first Dublin itinerant settle committee was Sherry Orchard. We had a camp committee. We called it Dublin itinerant settle settlement committee. And the next big robbery was the bit of power that travelers had accumulated by making the stand at Cherry Orchard because they brought a whole battalion of guards up there. And the owners of the land, of course, we thought it was corporation land. That, that was, I remember going down the lane and asking an old lady in the cottage who said, I said, who does that great big piece of land over there belong to? 26 acres of it. And she said, ah, for sure, it belongs to corporation for sure. So, you know, we, we, we sort of sussed out that we were occupying Dublin Corporation land, but in, in fact, it belonged to a company called Bully Firma Textiles, who were there to as a land investment, because of course now it's an industrial estate, so they must have made a lot of money out of it. Um, but having taken over that land and having barricaded it, although we couldn't barricade the whole piece of land, what we did do is we built the school along one side and we dug ditches so that other wagons could be drawn into a little fortified area. And they brought up a whole battalion of guards, I was just saying, and they drew up outside the Cherry Orchard Fever Hospital. And all the lads came up and women too, up, up to the wire, a, a, a new wire fence had been built along that side, put up along that side. Um, that was partly because I, I, I sort of digress because little things pop up. Why a fence went up? Because the chaplain at the fever hospital complained that because of our the encampment, there was a rat infestation going on. Well, maybe there was, but you know we were more concerned with human lives than with rat lives. So we defied and stood our ground and everybody came up to that fence armed with every bit of sticks and bits of metal, looking pretty ferocious, particularly some of the women who came up from, from the back of the camp at that moment, from Galway women with the shawls and all that. And I went out in the middle of the road and I said, I said to the directors of the company and, and the uh, superintendent guards, I said, you come in this camp, you come over that fence, and there's going to be bloodshed. So off they back they went to their little, had a conference there in front of the Gerald Hospital. And lo and behold, about five minutes later, we saw the whole battalion swing around, turn to its right, and march off down the Bunny Firm Road. And what they did then, they passed about, I think there were about five buses of laborers who'd been got out of the um, labor exchange. Who'd come, they were to, supposed to come up and clear the camp and all that. The whole lot went, disappeared. So we had power because for God's sake, we, we, we stood that ground for four or five years until the corporation and the city and the council, uh, the, County Council, after much disputing who was responsible and who, 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 whatever, um, 
as is well known, planned the Lapre Park, the first uh, municipal campsite, or what do you want to call it, caravan site. But while we were still in the camp and had formed this Dublin Icenric Cabinet Settlement Committee, Archbishop McQuaid sent a priest to Jerry Orchard, Father V. Heating, who was kind of diplomatic type of priest who uh, came along with his black gloves on and didn't like coming in the mud much. But we had a meeting in the school. And at that moment, all the power the travelers accumulated was sucked out and taken into the hands of the church and a couple of good people, as Bernard said, well-meaning. There was Victor Bewley and there's Lady Wicklow. And they wanted to do something for us. But the word is they were now going to do something for the travelers. No longer was the travelers together going to do something for themselves. That was the big political robbery in my mind. Now, you mentioned mentioned scrap, scrap and at Cherry Orchard we started a scrap cooperative and it was estimated that travellers in Ireland at that time were putting about half a million pounds worth of scrap into the foundries. That was a huge contribution to the economy. Yes, the old, uh, the old trades had gone. Uh, several of the wards that came up, I remember Michael Ward and one or two of them, they came up still with that T-shaped anvils, you know, those little anvils that you can just stick into the ground. They had them there and they could knock out a, a perfect um, mug, perfect piece of work on it, but nobody wanted any more. I mean, it was all factory manufactured, but there was the scrap. And of course it was hoisting. I think we had about 75 horses on Cherry Orchard. So there was a horse dealing and there was a crap collecting and the economy kind of still went along, but it's true to say a lot of the old trades had disappeared and, you know, the economy of the travellers was right down to near zero to a point where the women had to go calling to the houses. That that was a big part of the income because Victor Bewley, God bless him, Lucky Publeske, he gave work to two, two girls at Jerry Orchard. That was Teresa Mohan and Anne Wall to work in his cafe in Grafton Street. And what he was going to pay them, I think, was something like four pounds a week to work in the kitchen. They could, they were going to be subsequently perhaps become made um, waitresses. But anyway, they had a job in the kitchen. But they only stuck it out for about two weeks. And we all got around and had a meeting in the school and said, you know, what, 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 you know, this was a great opportunity. Why won't, you know, why won't you stick this out? They said, no way, because when we go calling, we can make about 30 shillings a day. So in the week, we can earn more calling than we can get from Victor Bewley. Thanks very much. So we're not stopping any longer. I think there was other feelings running through it as well, but that was the, the basic economic arg argument of it. I think that's what we're trying to do in many ways, is try to look at this in different ways, not just one way, because if we were to go one way, it would sound morbid, it'll sound destitute, it'll be all sorts in there. Um, looking at it three ways. So if we look at it, the state, uh, on part of the state, they will see as an intervention. They might say, we didn't recognise ethnicity or ethnic cultures. We didn't know anything about that kind of stuff. We just wanted to get people in off, absorb them and get them stop being an eyesore. And of course, what was going on was JFK was in the country. He just left um, a few weeks after the report was released. So there was this kind of international new monetization going on also. And travellers kind of got systematically uh, wrapped up in that. But that's one way of looking at it. But this... What was that, Bernard? I missed it. It was 
uh, what was going on at the time was that JFK was in Ireland. Oh, in, oh yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. that very well. Yeah. Being yeah, a fall cool. were yeah, trying yeah. to uh, yeah, there was a, business yeah, people cool. to bring prosperity into the country and investment from the Americans. Yeah, of course. Uh, the mass I, government and all the new ideas of factories. Yeah. This eyesore of uh, itinerants had to go. But there was a couple of things in there, right? The, the report itself. It started off well, regardless good intentions, bad intentions or whatnot. It did set out because they did say it was a final solution. They did set out to put these people in a very destitute situation where we know um, some were, some fell into that situation and needed support. But there was by and large quite a lot of travellers who did not fall into that category. They were mobile, they had an economy, they were making yeah. a living, they were doing better than most settled people. They had pretty good health. When the commission when met these people, they passed remarks that the travellers did not feel inferior to the settled people. It was quite right. the contrary. So now you have a healthy working people who didn't feel inferior, but now were the nationwide um, target by the state as the people who were destitute. Mm -hmm. That's right. They yeah. were going to need to be absorbed for their own good. So we do try to see it different ways. That, that's two ways. That's the traveler way of seeing it and um, with friends. It's also the way of the state might see it. They say, look, we have hindsight now but well, we didn't know these things at the time. If we'd known mm. that, we wouldn't have gone that path and so on. Maybe, so maybe. They, but, maybe. But there, were, but there were also Romanists there, involved, there a, you know. There, yeah, there is a third way of looking at it. No, that's right. Yeah. And the third way was the much bigger picture as to why did we get into a situation in Ireland where the state had labelled one fraction of the community and put them in contrast to what, what they were calling the settled people. And the settled people had to be protected from the itinerant ways. So when we look at that, because the word settled in itself is, is, is interesting, is why would Irish people be making distinctions between settled and unsettled? Who made the people settled in the first place? Itinerant, tinker, all these labels came from 16th century English colonization. There were labels that came with the English into a Gaelic world and then put them on the Gaelic people after breaking it down, breaking it down, breaking it down. So I've often tried to say this to travellers and travel, some travellers, organisations, think when I say this, that we we're taking away our ethnicity, that we we're taking away our experience, and our culture. I'm saying we are called travellers now. I was called traveller, gypsy, yeah. itinerant, tinker, knacker, yeah. and every other name in my lifetime. And these labels are centuries old. So my parents and their parents and their parents were also called these labels. So what I was saying is, who put these labels on us in the first place? And of course, I'm going to hand over to Dylan on this one because he's going to give us a bit of a framework. Good one. Until 1922, of course, no systems changed. The old English waited in Dublin. They put the Gaelic shawl over themselves, told the world that they were the Gaelic Irish. And that the people in the West were something else, especially these ancient old nomadic uh, Thai people. Um, mm. So, yeah, I'll, I'll talk over to Dylan. Maybe he can also. And the reason yeah. I'm doing this is try to give the audience a bigger picture. Brian's work is quite yeah, valuable. Grafton's mm. is priceless. But to have a bigger picture, this way, then there is no, we're not pointing the finger at anybody. We're not blaming the government. We're not blaming the state. We're not blaming anyone. We're saying this is so old and systematic and complex that there might be solutions out of it if we can part for a moment with all the colonial stuff, the labels. So can, can I just say that yeah. maybe, look, I'm I'm no expert in etymology, but tinker may have a good root. Tinker, workers in metal. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. That, tin, that's a, being tin and care. Yeah, which uh, that, is that, just that's the other work. thing that I, I should have put, and thank you for saying yeah, that. I think, when I say it, it sounds like I'm trying to erase it. But it became a bad word, of course. It was yeah. used in a very derogatory we, sense. We, we yeah, still, yeah we, we still refer to ourselves every so often as tinkers, although we never met a pot or a book in our life. But because it's a label that we wore with pride, because it was one that was associated with the gift of one's hands to create something. Uh, so we all thought that was a, a, a good uh, insult to give us. Uh, we didn't mind that one. Uh, itinerant one, we were mind-boggled about itinerant. You're itinerant, isn't it? Yeah, well, we just couldn't figure the itinerant one. Tinker one, we could keep. The Naka one, 
there's also debates around that. It came from the word nacre, uh, nacre being the knack or the knack have something. Other people associate with yards that date horses and stuff like that. Yeah. But here's what the, about Parvi? Parvi, the, uh, and, any good? and Minker, absolutely. Minker or Parvi. These, these are self a self identifying labels. So why would you self identify yourself in the first place unless you were in contrast to somebody else who wasn't you? In other words, if there was no travellers, there would be no word settled. There would be no They're need. They're called buffers. Buffers. Where yeah, are the bu- well, country the people. Folk with the buffers, weren't they? Absolutely. So I think it's that kind of walls. We're not trying to say that it's a direct standoff, that there is this rock-solid divide between these two cultures. We're saying that it's more complex. We're saying that the settled people, now they're called settled people, Irish people in general, have absorbed and were assimilated themselves by the English colonialists. And that became evident in 1922 when Trinity College, Manuk College, Royal College of Surgeons, military land rights, none of it, absolutely zilch of it, had moved an inch other than calling it Irish. And this has confused the whole nation into the state of what is Irish? Am I Irish? Am I not Irish? Am I a better Irish than the ones in the East? And so on and so forth. When all of it uh, is, to my opinion, bigger that bigger picture, is ongoing psychological colonization. Because when people think of colonization, they think of the physical aspects of it. They don't think about uh, Edmund Spencer and all these guys talking about how to change the psyche of these people to eventually eradicate their Gaelic culture, demise their language, Mm. uh, assimilate them into an English program of thinking. And that has been happening, what I can see, for centuries. So I'm going to throw it to Dylan um, get him on the guy, get him off the wall and off the ball, that kind of stuff, and see what uh, he throws back to us. Uh, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, anytime. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I, I just make comment on people, what people are saying there. I mean, it's inter- very interesting what uh, Grafton's talking about in that. Um, the the uh, just to even the the tinker idea. Say, like back in the 1950s, I seen a first survey. I think it was a school's folklore survey or whatever, where they asked children all over the country in about 1950, uh, who were travellers around you? What are their names? That kind of thing. I think it was a few little questions. And they did it with all the primary schools all around the country. And I, and I think at that time, they were very well spread out. Uh, mo- most travellers, I believe, were in the West, even still at that time. But as we were talking about, as the economy broke down, say up until the 1940s, I'd say that you could still make a living uh, tinkering or whatever with metal work and horses and things like this. Um, but uh, that broke down with the introduction. I've seen it mentioned a few times about plastic and various other things uh, that, that people took to all this uh, non-repairable kind of stuff and what have you. Um, and then you you have a uh, uh, by 1963 what, what you're describing there is people have had to have been forced to drift towards Dublin and into in, uh, into the outskirts of Dublin as they bring in um, uh, basically as the as we were talking about that that kind of traditional economy where travellers were moving around from amongst the buffers or amongst the uh, amongst the settled world in and around Connacht Munster places like this mostly around the west I think. Um, Going back to the early 1900s, I think even Galway would have had the highest proportion of travellers uh, within it. Uh, so both, you know, if we're going to call people that, that's, you know. Um, so there was a big movement towards the east, which actually might explain, and I haven't, there's no big study on this, but I would ex- it might explain some of the pressure that Grafton's describing, where Dublin suddenly, why, did, why in 1960s does it suddenly decide that there's a problem? Well, it would do when land starts being occupied by travellers moving in from the west and from other parts of the country. Uh, some of them will have already been around Dublin, but the numbers were increasing as far as I understand. And from from, from your testimony, there was people coming from as far away as Galway at, at the oh. at, at your time. And these the women with the shawls and very, you know, more traditional kind of uh, uh, um, background. Um, and, and that would make sense because actually what Grafton also describes of um, of them really having no particular plan in the council in Dublin beyond wanting to push them to the city limits um, is also something that would be completely typical, actually, in terms of if we were to look at, as, as Bernard's saying, if we were to say that how far back would that go? Well, that would, we go far, far back beyond 1920s because it would be, it, it's, it, it would be standard issue for the Cor- Dublin Corporation and its laws because of its 
uh, laws on the city limits, vagrancy laws. Um, laws when you went back to the famine, they brought in an 1847 vagrancy law, for example, right at the height of the famine, um, which stopped, which people had to get on boats to go to America. They couldn't go eastward, couldn't go towards Dublin. They were prevented from movement in that direction, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and if you keep stepping back, like, you know, into the 18th century, the 17th, doesn't matter. The origin of those particular, the Dublin Corporation, not, not the corporation itself, but all the institutions in Dublin would essentially be descended from what would have been regarded as an English administration, which it was an English administration. It was actually an extension of the, of the English state and had been since the 12th century. Beyond the pale. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In a way. People couldn't yeah. come in from beyond the pale or couldn't come into Dublin. Yeah, and so what you're what what we'd say you're describing is they basically they're only the the it would have been since for that from that perspective at least from time immemorial they would push yeah. uh, Irish out towards the edge of the city, right. uh, you know, and certain acceptable Irish might be allowed into the city type of thing. But uh, as as Bernard has said, that's the reason we would be interested in things like in what happened in 1922. Well, did anything change after the revolution and that? Well, no, there was a counter revolution which actually proper fastened a lot of these old English laws um, to kept them in operation. Mm. So actually it wouldn't, wouldn't matter really how, how well-meaning someone was or even how revolutionary someone was after 1920s. The, it would still be the fact that the, the church on one side and the, the state itself, though, the body of law of the state was specifically created during the colonial era. And that had all been kept. And therefore, the idea in general would be that what, what we're looking at there is that it didn't res it didn't have any other way to respond except its traditional way and its laws and the laws were to prevent had been created at a time when actually the Gaelic the moving majority of the country was actually a sorry that was a majority and the cities were the minority right if you go right back to the 16th century that actually that's actually mm -hmm. the way around it is and the pale was the minority and this this idea of the settled and civilized world within the pale that was the mi minority and the laws were designed to protect that and to make to keep it that that was the civil world, as it were. And so there was like civil Irish and wild Irish. And the idea was to protect the civil world from the wild Irish in general. And um, although these laws change on the outside, they don't change much uh, in terms of the first vagrancy acts are way back in the 1540s, I believe, um, and originally applied in, in the English parts of the of, of the island because they couldn't apply them anywhere else. They didn't have any power. But um, as the as they expanded control over the country, these vagrancy acts applied to the whole country, and as they push people out of their lands, they be, they then designate them with a label of either wild Irish or vagrants or rapparees in the old days, and then over time that becomes just uh, tinkers in the nineteenth century. So did uh, they use the word gypsy at all? Say back in the sixteenth, seventeenth century, like in England, there were laws against gypsies. Under Henry VIII, I'm wondering if there was some kind of parallel in Ireland or what? Yeah, there was, I'll tell you what there was. I'll tell you what, what the, the, they had a thing in Ireland where they would have. The firstly, they had two categories. They had civil Irish that they regarded as the ones that were various types, maybe in within and around the pale, or ones that acted mm -hmm. in an English manner. Okay, and then they had wild Irish originally, and they, they didn't initially compare them exactly to gypsies. They didn't call them gypsies. They were, aware, they were aware of gypsies, but I'll tell you what they did do is is they 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 did use the word uh, gypsy and and nomads and Scythians they used to be into calling them Sc okay. Scyth Scythians and things like this. Uh -huh. uh, what they were doing often from the 16th century on was invoking uh, the old Roman texts or Latin texts, and what they would say is that we're like the Romans, we're the civilized world, yeah, and therefore, and therefore the outside the civilized world beyond the pale is the world of nomads, and if they're nomads, yeah. if it's the world of nomads, like the Roman experience, mm -hmm. that means that that would mean that we can we we can take the land because nomads can't own land. Yeah, and therefore, yeah. Uh, it was in They're, their interests. Yeah. yeah, it was in their interest to create a law, to create a body of law that said that the Irish were nomadic, even the ones that weren't. Ah. Um, now the Irish were. More the situation was, I mean, a lot of Irish did move around in, in circuits and, uh, uh, you know, had a, a more mobile uh, lifestyle. Uh, and so it was convenient to be able to to um, 
but this but there's two different things going on there's the lifestyle of people which is what it, what it is and then there's the way the law is looking at it or the way the state has created it and uh, it, it was in its interests in the early days to uh to claim the irish were um uh, nomadic or that they were uh, more like like gypsies or that kind of thing now the word gypsy i didn't see i wouldn't see in the old text in re regard to ireland until was it pastoral perhaps you know nomads moving with 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 animals yeah like absolutely they, yeah. they yeah, moved yeah. around different counties big areas probably yeah 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 ireland, ireland was open ground so it was beyond it was right. literally beyond the pale was that it had the roman world hadn't been here the land was more open so that it wasn't fenced. It didn't have the the hedgerows running along those the roads. That kind of thing didn't really exist. And so you could. It was like the high plains. You you really could move on horseback quite quite large distances over the country. Um, I mean, there was roads and bogs and everything that we were familiar with. But the but the land between the settlements was more or less open. Uh, it wasn't enclosed. And this was a process that happened in England, as you know as well. The the enclosure acts in the 16th century and that where they they turfed a lot of the peasants off the land and grabbed the land for the state, Henry VIII and all of them, brought in enclosure acts, then declared all the people in England who they'd kicked off the land to be vagrants mm. and started branding them and everything. And they were very cruel about it to the English as well. And this process, they've started in the English Pale as well. Now, it originally wouldn't have affected the, the, the Irish in their traditional settings beyond the Pale initially, but obviously as the state, by the end of the 16th, by 1600, the state now controls the whole country. And therefore, English law applies to the whole country. And therefore, anyone who's now just thrown out of their traditional lands or the traditional area, they would have moved, you know, for example, the Irish would have moved cattle from the lowlands to the highlands every uh, summer to the high grazing mm -hmm. pastures and then move them back down in the in the winter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as we saw, we were looking at Bernard, they have descriptions of the villages in the spring would be quite big. In the summer, the villages would get smaller as the people moved the animals up to the high high ground, um, and maybe on doing various other types of tasks, whatever they were traveling for. And then the villages in the autumn would be swell, would be a lot bigger again, uh, as they sort of buckle down for the winter. Um, yeah, where was I now? Oh yeah, um, yeah. I, I don't want to go on too much. What I, what I'd say is though is that when you look when you look at that kind of. Uh, picture that I think it's very important to see that 19 uh that after 1922 they really don't change any laws and therefore we don't we could say that these um the old the old division between that pale which is where the law comes from and and the idea of the last remain you know how would we put it the last remaining people who are living in the old ways in Ireland yeah um now becomes uh, 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 the con the conflict reemerges essentially. It was less visible under the uh, empire, shall we say, um, where up until the famine, for example, like vast amounts of the country were still Irish speaking, were still actually very high, very dense population across most of the west and central center of the country, um, and the English didn't really differentiate that much at the time. The English had run from London, so it didn't really differentiate that much. But the administration Dublin was always there. And it go, its roots go right back where it's, uh, you know, a, a, almost a conflict of um, not just an English-Irish thing, but it's sort of like what is the the state? The state, uh, the state is as legitimate as opposed to a completely different system uh, that the, that the Irish live outside the state. And so there was always Irish outside the state, and travellers have never been part of the state, if you know what I mean, and never benefited from it in that way. So up. Oh to a certain point so yeah it's that continuation but at a certain point i think it was in 2013 now there's a lot of dates i mean endless there's like programs there's research there's uh, the trespass law very controversial stuff most happening every few years to these people but some of them kind of stick out the 2000 2013 report traveling with austerity uh, which should be familiar to brian harvey because i believe you were one of the researchers involved and, and I looked at the first page of it, and I won't lie to you, because one of the other main reasons why me and Dylan have been doing this for so long is to to get to, to tell people that despite the good programs, despite the goodwill, despite the good intentions, we have stats and facts telling us that psychologically our community has gotten worse, worse and worse. 
even with state inventions, even with travel support groups, because they all had adapted a narrative that was actually causing friction, friction with the rest of the community and reality. So in 2013, the state decided once again it was going to step in and shake things up. There was off the back of austerity, I guess. Uh, it's why you were calling it travelling with austerity. But some of the programmes um, were absolutely wiped out. Education, inclusion, equality. It was like chunks of it were taken. People were left with minimised, um, some of it none, but some other parts was like 12% left, 14%, 28% left. Could you tell us, Brian, in your experience as a researcher working with communities, regardless who they might be, what does that do to a community already struggling to, to stand on their own feet? I think there are a couple of things here. First of all, I'd like to pick up a point that Dylan made there um, at the beginning, which was 1922. Um, what happened in terms of our social policy around then? The answer is not very much. The new state was extraordinarily conservative. Um, as Joe Lee, the Cork historian, once said, the newly liberated soon felt the lash of their liberators. Uh, and um, there was very little innovation when Britain adopted the welfare state programmes. It did like a national health service, which we still don't have in 1948. The big programmes of housing and education in the late 40s, as did the other European countries. Ireland had been isolated from all of that. So the significant improvements that developed in other European countries did not happen here. And this was compounded, I think, by the whole period of the Celtic Tiger. You may remember the phrase by Mary Harney of, we are Boston, not Berlin. We follow a social model whereby economic activity is greatly valued, whereby we do, the state is small, it does not spend too much on social programs, people need to organize their own economic welfare and so on. It is not the business of the state to be propping people up through uh, welfare programs, comprehensive state services and so on. So what happened in 2013 with austerity, the ground had been well prepared before that. The, for example, the abolition of the Combat Poverty Agency, which was the state agency uh, responsible for issues of social deprivation, that actually happened well before as the, we even heard the austerity, the A word there. Uh, the disbandment of the Community Development Programme had been set in train before that. The state had already taken the decision to reduce the voluntary and community sector, the social side of the state before austerity. And when austerity came, that galloped enormous momentum. 43 state agencies were abolished. Most of them were uh, state agencies, uh, sorry, were social agencies. But I think it's not difficult to make the case that the traveller community, which was already the most disadvantaged single group within the state, suffered most. Do you know that, for example, the housing programme for travellers is still funded 50% less than it was in 2008, that many education mm. programmes simply disappeared, that the funding of traveller community groups has barely recovered to its 2008 level at a time when if you ask most economists about austerity, they would say, oh, that was over in 2014, wasn't it? But for voluntary and community groups working with a very wide range of people, um, uh, that has not happened. There's still working at levels below 2008 because the Irish social state has universally become smaller. I think another point you made was really important there, which you referred to task forces and reports. If task forces, reports, institutional mechanisms, advisory bodies, and those kind of things could resolve the issues facing the traveller community, that would have happened long ago. Uh, we're drowning in reports and, and so on at this stage, including some, as you point out, that I've written. But there remains this wall of resistance. Just to give you one small example, which I know, Bernard, you'll be familiar with. Several years ago, Pavi Point commis commissioned a report on traveller homelessness, which looked at the interface between uh, the traveller community and homelessness, from which uh, travellers were experiencing great 
ever more experiencing at a time when the level of homelessness went up from 3,000 a year in the 1980s to what we now have a figure of over 12,000. And travellers were, travellers were at least as much a victim of that process within housing, the smaller housing social state, down from seven or 8,000 houses a year to only 75 in 2015. So when the report on traveller homelessness was ready for publication, what was the reaction of the Irish state? The health service executive decided that it was, quote, not in the national interest that it even be published and tried to suppress it. When it did come out, one of the key recommendations was that the housing of travellers be the responsibility of a new separate state agencies, that the powers be taken away from the local authorities, who had not only failed to house travellers, but were one of the main bodies responsible for their evictions and for their homelessness and for their not receiving housing under the Housing Act. And the model actually already exists in Ireland. In Northern Ireland, discrimin against, discrimination against Catholics in housing was so intense that in 1968, the British government intervened and said, we cannot trust the local authorities of Northern Ireland to provide equal opportunities in housing. So the responsibilities for the local authorities in Northern Ireland for housing was taken away from them completely despite unionist protests and the Northern Ireland housing executive was set up and you can criticize it for not doing enough uh, for travelers in Northern Ireland but at least the problem of discrimination that existed before is no longer one of the problematics but here what has happened here the government does not want to even discuss such an idea it would be an acceptance that the state had not fulfilled or lived up to its responsibilities. It would be a rebuke to the local authorities. Well, of course it should be because they haven't been doing their job and we can't have that. So institutional ideas and pressures and the Conservative Irish state, aided by a media that is uninterested to discuss this problem or issue or proposed solution, mean that the problem continues to be manifested in the same bad old way as before. So we've, I think, very much reached an impasse where there are solutions available. There are, for example, many possibilities that can be done on the issues of housing, of education, small and large. The traveller economy, which is something that is barely even talked about, uh, but which provides a route out of many of these the difficulties that the travellers face. Um, a whole set of issues that, that could mark the way forward, but the Irish state lacks the ability, the will, um, the preparation, the insight, um, the acceptance of, for example, a human rights based approach with human rights institutions prepared to leave up, lead up. Uh, the attack on discrimination against travellers. In Britain, they had these mechanisms in the 1960s because they were recognised to be significant migrant communities in Britain then. We only came to recognise in this state the traveller community in 2017, if I've got my date right there again. But the mechanisms have not followed from that. So we're not learning. The Our state is not learning and not interested to learn the institutional lessons. I don't know how we break this very vicious circle. I have to well, say. Yeah. If reports alone could do it, we would have done it. But it requires a whole set of measures, social, economic, human rights and empowerment based. Just for well, you know, to we'll just, just to I say do. something about housing, housing. Right back then in the 60s, there were a few families. You could you could theoretically get a get a house from, from the Dublin Corporation, but you had to you had to give up your wagon and it was burnt my big bill by casting some paraffin on it burnt and that could have been the biggest asset the traveler family had you know maybe it's worth 40 or 50 quid that wagon i had to be burned before you went into a housing but the problem that's been with housing and that's all over the british Isles. i don't know how much further travelers move into a house fine the women are this is great the women love it for a little while but the men say we can't continue our self-employment. Where are we going to start having a, a heap of scrap in the backyard? That's not going to be allowed. You know, you could not you could not have a lorry parked outside your house. You couldn't use the back garden, as I've just said, as a, as a as a dump for things you might be collecting to, to make a few pop. 
So people moved into houses, but they pretty rapidly moved out again. It just doesn't work unless the economic part of it is there. So you didn't mention the idea of caravan parks or transit parks or ways that people can come in now with beautiful trailers, extendable trailers, if you've seen them in France, or chalets or mobile homes. That's what travelers want, to make a community. Because the other thing was about housing is that a family moving into a street somewhere in the middle of a town is going to feel totally isolated from their relations. We're all extended families. So people want it to be an entire street if they're going to move into houses. So if that doesn't work, let's still think about the trailer sites. I mean, they're so common in America. People live in trailers. There's trailer sites everywhere. Why can't we have a few? Is it because they're unsightly, because they're regarded as substandard? Everybody's got to be in bricks and mortar. I don't know. So, yeah, I'm uh, sorry, Dylan was about to say something, but I'm sure he completely forgot about it now and I got distracted with that phone call. Yeah, yeah. I, was going to say, I was going to say one quick one quick thing because I yeah. probably wasn't too clear about it before. When you're talking about conservative state, I mean, it's it's off the charts sometimes, the conservatism, because um, when I, when I, it might sound, uh, it sounded like a long time ago to some people, but when I talk about, say, we say vagrancy acts in the 1500s, right? And it's not that I want to go back and talk about all of that, but what I mean is that the last, the last Vagrancy Act called a Vagrancy Act, they would have been done in sequences right up till 1847. And what I should have made clear as well is that by 1963, in that very report that you're talking about, the Vagrancy Acts are of 1847 are still being referenced in the appendix. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and so they're still using exactly that law going right back into the original time of the 16th century conquests, if you know what I mean, in, in Ireland. Um, and so there's conservatism for you if you if you if you would, would like to know about it. And further, like to going on saying what Brian's talking about there, the Irish state, you 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 can break that cycle, I think, but that's why we're going back that far in that sense that I think the Irish state has to realize that it would have to to get there, it would have to accept some of what we're talking about here. That actually this problem it 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 likes to in in an official sense, it likes to always act as if everything started in 1922 and that nothing before that is relevant. In fact, what happened before that was a different world. That was the empire. That's different. And that now uh, Dublin runs a different uh, kind of a shop. But actually, if you don't go back further, you actually never can solve the problem, uh, solve these di different problems that the state has and this sort of... Uh, because actually the, it's the mentality, it's the not just, it's the mentality that's created by the law and the law, most of the body of which was never created, uh, certainly wasn't created by the free state and was created long, long before that. In many cases, long before even, even in Britain, these laws have been repealed a long time ago and they don't, under, you know, they've not uh, had to deal with them for a long time or they would recognize quicker, like what Brian has described, they would recognize quicker injustices coming from the, from the old laws in the 17th and 18th century and all this. But in Ireland, many of those laws still were applying, as Bernard had pointed out to me before, uh, travellers and such issues as the state sees it were dealt with by the Department of Justice and the Department of Health, I think. And particularly, uh, the Department of Justice is very interesting because it's it's it shows the state still regarded as, as kind of like dealing with an, an enemy or dealing with someone beyond the beyond the pale, as we've described. Uh, this is an issue for internal security almost, mm -hmm. and, um, and therefore it's automatically a criminal issue in a sense that the, and so the trespass of horses, uh, in fact the trespass law is another mm -hmm. one in in with these vagrancy acts, yeah. um, and specifically to do with uh, movement onto land, horses uh, blocking movement in, in into land that's been um, that's not that's not owned by uh, people. Um, as you go further back, you'll see that the English, the, the main obsession of, as we said, of, of Dublin administration throughout the centuries of its existence has always been trying to stop Irish people moving, trying to stop them moving with cattle, trying to stop them moving with horses. Mm -hmm. And and in fact, even when we go right back to the 1600s, it's really fascinating to read about the physical uh, aspects of it where they, they actually design the road lines are designed that way like the roads and the idea of having hedges planted along each side of the road all the way along is specifically intended to stop irish movement 
uh, on the landscape, which had before that been open. And, um, you know, to channel it towards bridges and control points. And you can imagine it was a military architecture in, in many cases in Ireland because the wars here had gone on so long. Yeah. Go ahead. So, I, I've, I've got to go off in a couple of minutes. But all right, oh, sorry, uh, Bernard, yeah. you, you raised the idea of democracy. We can do it. We can yeah. do it. We've got the technology. We are building a democracy right now. And if you wanted a share of it, you could hold elections in Ireland for a representative body amongst travellers. We can do it. Yeah, that's actually... Well, I think that, yeah. the, that the idea of the Ballin and Slow Convention was along those lines, because you knew a lot of people were coming to the fair. Let's meet up in the town hall. Let's have some kind of mandate from travellers. But that can be done now in a technical way, just through... Nearly everybody has a mobile phone now. We can do an election through mobile phones and have some kind of representative body. And this is what we're aiming to do in a in a congress that's only at the planning stage, but in Brazil, where there's a, a very big number of Roma, to have proper elections, a mandate from the people, have our own democracy, and that would change the political scene pretty much. That's my last bit. I'm, I'll just disappear in a moment, but okay, well, farewell we... to everybody. If and that's actually I have to be back here was uh, what would be some of the solutions and I know you're involved with setting up the Roma Congress um, and the federations and we're all into that because we like politics yeah. but we're also taking the path of healing in many ways and that's a, a more challenging one because we're living in a thorny bush we would need something that's semi-autonomous um, something that can't do harm to ourselves something that can't do harm to others but something that isn't stateside isn't sad influenced by the state and cannot be even what we call travel organizations. Because I, I point this out to travelers many times. That all, I mean, every single last one of the travel organizations were actually set up by settled people. All the top jobs and all the top influence came from middle class Irish. All the NGOs were designed for the convenience of settled people. This is not to go out about the poor settled people. They're lovely people. But we're saying we would need something slightly different from that. And with Travision Foundation, we were looking at that institutionalized, knowledge-based, origin-based, community experience, linking it across a bridge with institutionalized people, as opposed to us becoming institutionalized just to prove a point. Uh, Brian, I'm going to give it over to you. And I know, Grafton, you have to go, my old friend. And we are so happy to have you on. And as I said before to you, I am most personally grateful that people like you have come along accidentally or not I don't care uh, but you've made a positive impact to travellers and you've given us something to kind of reach in terms of political aspirations and so on and so forth people like Brian Harvey are no different this guy was like a Jedi standing up to the state agencies and the empire when they tried to suppress his work he wasn't having it this is important work it's important to our community so I'm grateful for both of your existence in life. Bernard, um, could I interrupt you for just a second? Never, I'm on a roll. Go on. <laughs> the people who said no to the suppression of my report, they weren't me, they were travellers. They were young traveller women ah. who said, this is disrespectful, this is unacceptable. They used the most important word in the civil rights vocabulary, which was no. So it came from them, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with what you've been saying about a traveller-led, traveller-organised movement for travellers. If you look at those communities which have advanced their well-being, I refer, for example, to the civil rights movement in the United States for Blacks and others. I refer to the Catholic community in Northern Ireland through the civil rights movement there 50, the years was a traveller. Um, That's right, yeah. Yes. So that, that that to me is the way forward. And I think there are also some good examples technically about who do, how you do that. If you look at the Roma community in Eastern and Central Europe, where, yeah. for example, uh, the programs, they've mainly been introduced by uh, the Soros Foundation, but they're about developing yeah. young traveller leadership. 
particularly amongst mm -hmm. girls. Um, so that because this is going to take a very long time, I think we can agree on that. Therefore, we start mm -hmm. with the younger, more educated generation, uh, and they learn their skills of independence and saying no from a very early stage. And that's a very long, slow and indeed painful way forward. But it is ultimately the way this will work. So my well, apologies it's for not, interrupting. It's not going to take long, and I, I, I would disagree with you. Okay. When, when they came to evict people at Dale Farm, it took five minutes for people to become extremely radical okay. and realize we're going to defend our homes no matter what. And they did it. It doesn't what? take a hell of a lot of education to know that we've okay. got to stand up when people bring in laws which are, in fact, brutal, inhuman, and have got to be opposed. Yes. Well, and one of the Sometimes teams... the law is an ass. <laughs> also, I what worries me sometimes a bit about that, that um, that's what was the state decided to do. They decided that the way to break down these people was actually go after their women, is to focus on the women, uh, because the women then would educate their children, and before they know it, they'd all become settled people. And in a way, is that's kind of slightly happening. They are winning that battle because again, we're back to the stats, the facts, the reports to tell us. <laughs> That something is fundamentally wrong here and it isn't of a physical nature and it isn't of a funding nature. It's a psychological one. Gentlemen, so, I am very grateful to have all of you on. Grafton, I know I went over time with you. My apologies. I hope to get Brian back on again so we can talk about space flight nonstop. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for your time, each and every one of you. Very welcome. Okay. Thanks to all. I learned a lot. I learned a lot from this. It's great. Great stuff. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. Brian, thank you very much again, my friend. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.